Okay, and we're on. Um, welcome back to the Topcast. This is episode two of The Greatest Stories Never Told. We have Chloe on this week. Before we go there, um, I just want to let you know about a giveaway that we're doing this week. Just to help grow the page you know, organically and see if we can reach a few people that may need to hear this. You never know. So this week was sponsored by JP... JP? <laughs> JBPT. <laughs> So that's Jay Boyne Personal Training. I'm not doing any more takes. <laughs> uh, so what Jay, if you don't know who Jay Boyne is, you can go check him out, he's a good friend of mine. He's a level six advanced personal training. He's other qualifications. I'm not gonna sit here and list them out because I don't know them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so what Jay's giving, out, uh, giving away is 200 euros worth of online coaching. It's one-to-one -one and it includes a free month of one-to-one -one coaching with tailored nutritional guidelines, a custom home workout, assistance with your routine, structure and habits, continued support for weekly check-ins and weekly phone calls. And now more than ever, I think it's needed. So we're all stuck at home, structure's falling, we're all, our work and routine is just not there. We're going to bed late, we're waking up late, we're feeling groggy. The New Year's resolutions haven't worked out in our favour because the gyms are closed. So I think this is a great chance to, to kickstart your year and uh, kickstart your, your new healthy habits and your new healthy lifestyle. So um, to be in with a chance of winning, follow the Instagram account and tag two friends in a post and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Leave a comment there. Anyway, anyway you can find the podcast, follow it. Um, Apple, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, whatever. Just fucking follow it and share it. And if you don't like it, then fuck off. Uh, but yeah, to be able to chance of winning, just get onto the Instagram page and let us know. Once we see it, you'll be into it, entered into a draw where Jay himself will pick the winner and you'll, you'll be in touch. So, briefly moving along. Uh, this week we have a young girl from the flats of Press House. Um, she grew up there all her life. Uh, her name is was Chloe Nolan, and it's now Chloe Butler. <laughs> uh, she's a niece of mine, my eldest niece. I became an uncle at six when Chloe was born. Um, Chloe has a great story to tell, um, great speaker. She's uh, ambitious, she's young, she's hungry for stuff. She wants to, wants to make a life for herself. And she's coming on here, she's brave, she's leaving herself vulnerable. She tells her story openly. If you go on to her page, you can see some of her posts. She, she's no, she's no, not afraid of talking openly about some struggles with mental health and whatever else that she's been through but I won't give away too much I'll let Chloe get into it herself so Chloe thanks for coming on you're welcome she thanks was for a, having me she was a last minute uh, guest change we had a um, bit of a fumble this morning these things happen it's gonna happen but Chloe was scheduled to come on later but she stepped in like a trooper so appreciate it um, so want to tell us a little bit about you who you are where you're from what age you are all the basics start yeah. rambling away. My name is Chloe. I'm 21 years of age. I live in Pear Street my whole life. Uh, can't wait to get over, but that's not another day. Um, I have two younger brothers, and I live with my ma. And I just I love talking, uh, but when it comes to me telling my story, I just. I won't stop and I just feel that there's so many people out there that are so afraid and so embarrassed of struggling with mental health because I was one of them. I used to be absolutely scarlet talking about it because I used to get, she's only saying that for attention and everybody has bad days but I think, yeah, you see on social media everybody has bad days but what about them people that are actually diagnosed with these things, people that have to struggle with these mm. things their whole life and I was on medication upon medication and I was getting off our skill and I was taking the tablet and I was putting it in my mouth and I was like, I'm taking this tablet because I'm depressed. Yeah, and do you remember the first time you opened up about it um, on social media or on them type of platforms before? Look, I mean, obviously, I think the, f the way the stages go you force your suffering in silence, you think you're alone, you're isolated, it's a very lonely, yeah. dark place. Eventually, you open up to your family or your friends or whoever you open up to and then you kind of go through it and even in the midst of it or even if you come out the other side of it, 
you decide you're comfortable enough now to speak about it and you, you, you go online and you, you, you hope that it reaches someone who needs to hear it. Yeah. Do you remember your first time doing that or what yeah, was it? I do. I remember I went, walked down to Sandy Mountain Beach by myself. I had air phones in, I had my phone. I sat on the bench. I took the video 55 times because dogs kept running up and I stuttered and I didn't know what to say. And then I sat down and I said, you know what? Whatever comes out the next time is going to come out. And I just sat there. People walked by, people looked at me, but I just... I just spoke and I just, I, I knew that this was the right thing for me to do because I just knew there were so many other people suffering and I, I just wanted to be that one person to make that step and think, do you know what, if I reach one person, because 99% of people, I'm probably screenshot, put that in that group chat, look a whole, looking for attention, but the 1% is what I'm focused on. I'm not focused on the people that don't care. Scroll by my video, like don't watch it if you don't want to, but there's people that, I've got great response over the stuff that I post, so I'll con continue to do that for the people that. Yeah, so you have people there it. who you feel who it, it, yeah, it has helped. 100%. And you know, it's from my own experience, I have done it myself in the past, I've opened up a lot about my own mental health and, and my own issues in my past, and I understand what you're saying, I can relate with that. And especially with speaking on camera, Jesus, even now, still, I don't know how many times I've done it, I've been away from social media for over a year, so. Yeah. Even now, look, my nerves are only starting to dissipate now after what, about six minutes in, so they're just kind of fading away now, but you still get fucking very nervous. It's, it's, it's a fucking hard thing to do. Yeah. And the re the thing about opening up about mental health and stuff like that online and your battles with depression and my particular case, panic attacks and anxiety, and it kind of, um, it leaves you vulnerable. And it's easy for people to kind of point the finger and say, well, that's all just for attention and this, yeah. that, and the other, but... I had people when I went away, now what you don't, I kind of took a step away from social media since becoming a father and I kind of, I kind of started to value a pri more private life yeah. s since then. Now I'm not saying that's what everyone should do, but I feel like for now, for me, I just want to step away and, and, and be more private for myself and be more private in my own life. And, but I've bumped into people and I've met people who have said, and when I came back on, like they've said, geez, we've missed you, you know, we've missed your post, because yeah. I used to put a big, dark, deep, fucking, real detailed, stuff. real yeah. stuff. And, and it yeah. resonates with some people. Some people need to hear it. Yeah. And then you obviously you have the other sort of begrudgers and the sort of, the people they who- really has that bad day as well. You know, and, and, and then the fucking, I'm sure they get screenshot and put yeah. into WhatsApp groups and yeah. you know how it goes from there. And people who the slag and it's all a bit like the stick, but look, that just rolls off my shoulder with me. You know, it's, it doesn't really affect me. How did you, do you ever have any experiences with stuff like that? I think, being a being a girl, I've heard some things being like, Oh, she said this and she said that and straight away it just went over my head. I was like, I think I prepared myself for that though when I put right. it out there because right. I see online bullying, I see it all the time. Mm. It's it's everywhere on social media. People get hate for for ridiculous things. So I was like, Do you know what? Stuff like that just never I couldn't let it get to me because what I was doing I knew was right and I knew that I was reaching people and people were texting me and I focused on the positive side of it rather than people talking I and mean, we let them talk, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so your means to the end was like, I'm gonna post this, I'm hoping it's gonna help one person. If 10 people wanna fucking shit on me and, and abuse me and let slag them. me and call me this and call me that, yeah. let them, as long as that one person, one may, person may, yeah, yeah, exactly. may impact that day in a positive way. Yeah. Well, that's a good message I suppose we're talking about. And with you particular, um, experience with mental health issues what was it what, what were you diagnosed with first thing that i was diagnosed with was an eating disorder called bulimia when i was 14 i was obsessed with how i looked looking on social media i want to look like this i want to look like that i was 14 and i remember i started making myself sick and i really enjoyed it and then i got to the point where my mom was like to me you're always getting sick, like what are you doing? And I was saying, mind your business, do my man thought it was great, mind my business. I was I lost two stone within she didn't understand three obviously. weeks, she didn't know what was going on. I lost two stone in three weeks, I was delighted. Mm -hmm. And next of all, I'm sitting in a clinic talking about it, and I used to say, nothing wrong with me, nothing wrong with me. Didn't want anybody to talk about or I just wanted to be skinny. That's what my goal was, I wanted to be skinny. I was bullied for years and years over my weight, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna be skinny now. And I did it, and I did it the wrong way. And I'm 21 years of age now, and it's something, and it's the most hardest thing that I've ever had to deal with out of all my mental health 
issues yeah. eating the soda is the hardest thing because you have to grow up every day and you have to eat and you have yeah, to everything's yeah, yeah. about eating the girls are like go for food and i could never go on a date with a young flip because i wouldn't be able to keep it down it that goes it goes as far as that i just i lost myself and still to this day i struggle with it and it's the toughest thing that i've ever had to deal with so you feel like what, what age were you then 14. 14 and what you're 21 now yeah. so seven years on since that you've been diagnosed i could have started earlier than that obviously yeah but which is such a young age for the start the the the, the body image issues and stuff yeah. you know and like when you talk about body image issues do you think it's worse today do you think it's getting worse with the age of social media 100 yeah well, i think there's a lot of evidence out there that suggests like i know 13 or 14 year olds that are putting up now like i used to put up pictures of myself and you can see they got skinnier and they're constantly putting up pictures of themselves losing weight and I'm thinking oh my god you're you're too young I just want to shake them you're too young like you're yeah. actually too young the body issue if other somebody else has an issue with your weight that's their fucking issue yeah. you know what I mean that's their issue when they're, they're gonna just if they can if someone's gonna bully you for your appearance laugh at that because that's the only thing they can bully you for because mm. they can't bully you and nobody could bully me as a person because I knew I was a good person mm. and the only only thing you can call me is fat well fine that's no problem I'll yeah. take it and how now, do you find your relationship with food now do you think it's still suffering still stuff out when I go through hard times I sometimes I wouldn't eat sometimes I wouldn't eat for three days and then I'd binge and I'm like how can I not eat mm. it's the most horriblest relationship I feel it's to this day that I still have and I do think that it's a conversation that I need to have with myself that probably going back to talk to somebody about it for the, and I never wanted to do that but mm. I try and do years of age I think I'll just have to bite the bullet and think it's something that I still suffer with and it's something that I need help with still. Well at least you can admit that you know it's very very honest and very brave and a lot of people can't admit it and I think the first step is admitting it it's like anything it's like being an alcoholic or a, a drug addict yeah. it's first step is just admitting it to yourself and then accepting that right i need to do something here i need yeah. i can't do this by myself and i need help and, and putting your hands up and yeah. going and seeking it but until you do that you're just going to be stuck in limbo you know what i mean where it's just a constant um negative cycle of behaviors where you just one thing leads into the other it's yeah. like and then there's no break in the chain you know for me i had like I had a binge eating disorder. I never had a problem with starving myself. I was the opposite. I just couldn't stop fucking <laughs> eating. But I didn't eat because I was hungry. I ate because it was a form of self-harm. Yeah. I ate because I fucking hated myself. Yeah. And I, I was like, I got so comfortable with hating myself that until I gorged on such copious amounts of foods and until I felt like I couldn't even fucking get off me, like a turtle on his back lying in bed or on a couch couldn't get up, I was that full, yeah. I needed to get sick, like, and until I got to there, I wouldn't stop eating, and it was because I got so comfortable and so familiar with feeling that way, and it's a... It becomes a routine. Just, yeah, you don't know anything no. else. You, you don't know what it's like to feel good. Um, so, have you ever experienced that with binge eating? Like, I, I know some people who go from, and, and I've dealt with clients and, and, and people and that I've met and spoke to who... Have had to have suffered with bulimia, and they said they've went from one extreme to the other. Yeah, that's you know that's, that's exactly the way it was with me. I would fall into this depressive state, and I'd eat, eat, eat the way mm. the way anybody else would. I'd binge, I'd binge, and then I'd realise that I'm at the point on the way, and then I'm like starvation mode now. This has to happen, and it was a constant yo, yo. cycle, and it was still to this day I have problems with acid reflux and pains in my stomach that I get all the time and because of that well, I can, still have physical effects like because of it damage to yeah it. it has yeah well this is the thing and like I think one of the the common signs is and it comes with edu educating yourself on the matter and that's what I had to do I went out and done it now and let's don't get me wrong there's, there's always a chance and I still do fall back into bad patterns and bad behaviours and when I lost jeez I lost about seven I thought I lost about a hundred pounds in a year and i done that by cutting out carbs and doing a, what's called a ketogenic diet for the most part and all i found was when i lost the weight i went from 23 stone to like 15 or something like that and all i found was when i lost the weight was that 
when I looked in the mirror, I had a little bit more confidence. There was people fucking tilting me on. I was yeah. on the telly. Remember all that? I was on the news. I've told the story a hundred times. I felt with the confidence came a bit of arrogance, but at the same time, when I was looking at myself in the mirror, all I could see was the same person that was 20 trees down. Yeah. I felt like I was just a smaller version of it, you know what I mean? Because I lost it so fast. And they say, um, in order to, like they say, quick success builds an ego. Yeah. And slow success builds character. So that's very true in that 100%. sense, because I built a fucking ego when I done that in a, in a year. But I found it so hard to keep off. And even now today, I was going, I was doing pretty similar to what you were doing and what most people do is, well, that worked for me before, so I'm going to keep going back to it. But the definition of insanity comes to mind is that if you keep trying the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, you're not going to yeah. get there, you know? So it's like, what happened with me was I had to go educate myself and people say, you need to find a balance and you need to find this. And but balance is one of the fucking, and I feel like I'm getting better at it. Yeah. But it's, tough. it's a very hard thing to find balance. Yeah. It's a it's a very and no matter what you're talking about here, like whether you're talking about alcohol, whether you're talking about I'm a, I have been and always always was and it's what I'm trying to change with myself. It's one of my flaws is I'm an all or nothing person. So I'm either doing something, I'm all in on it. So yeah. I'm gonna cut out carbs, I'm not gonna eat sugar, I'm not gonna eat takeaways and I'll and I'll fucking dive into that. But then as soon as I stop I'll, I'll blow out and I'll do the opposite and I'll gorge. Yeah. Because I'm all in or I'm all out. But finding that middle ground, that balance, is what people talk about a lot, and it gets thrown around a lot. Oh, you need you just need to find balance. But th that's that's true. That's very true. But it's finding that balance with yourself fucking hard. And you it's know? the triggers as well that people don't talk about. That the little triggers that go for food. Oh, I can't go now. Like no. oh, I, I can't go for food with my friends because I'm gonna have to get sick. Or or close the door and turn the shower on so I can get sick. So my mom doesn't hear me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's things yeah. like that that you still. It is the small things like that yeah. that no one sees. That no one and sees that, that you have to deal with. Like, and like you say, self harm. Like, I have scars on me, I'm from self harm, but I have scars on me, me stomach from getting mm. sick for seven years straight. True. Do you know what I mean? I have get sore throats all the time from getting sick. Yeah. It's it's all of that stuff that comes along with it. And I don't really don't think eating disorders are something that is talked about as much today. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Well, I think, like, I, I, don't, I don't think it's as bad as it was with the likes of. I don't know about eating disorders, but mental health is starting to break through a lot. Yeah. And I think, I think it's kind of become a bit popular. That's the thing, isn't yeah, it? People, that's, that's what I'm saying. People <laughs> this always is what, say, this is called true "Everybody has a bad day." Yeah, but what about those people that are suffering every single day? Yeah. You know what I mean, what yeah. about everybody? What that, that one what bad day? What do you mean, like when have, you say everyone had a bad day? Like, like someone people, trying to play it down, yeah, like get over it, try pull to their play socks up. Yeah, people try to say like you're putting this up and all, but everybody goes through a bad time. Yeah, but try yeah. that you one bad day. What about having that for a few months? What about having that for a few weeks? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Actually diagnosed with things. Do your research mm. sometimes. I don't feel like sense people mm. are just uneducated mm. about it. Before but you go, I've had times in my life where. Like I know exactly what you're saying. It hits every individual differently. We all deal with things differently as individuals. But I've had times in my life where one day I feel on top of the world. I feel invincible. I feel like Jesus. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do that. And this is what's happening today. And I feel it's all fucking good. And I could literally probably haven't felt down in bleed months. Like and everything's going so well. And the next day I could feel suicidal. Yeah. Out of nowhere. Yeah. So like, I've often wondered about that. Like like. That scares me, yeah. you know, and there's been times when I've had bit, been in good mental health and I, I went and s saw counselling and I, cu I, I couldn't get it because I wasn't in fucking in a bad way. I wasn't suicidal, yeah. but I was like, yeah, I'm in a good place now, but I want to stay here. So that's why I'm going to try do this because the way I look at it is I'm going to maintain my mental health. Yeah. I'm not going to try to get out of a hole. I want to stop myself from getting into the hole. And I tried to see psychiatrists because I didn't know why this would happen and I was afraid when that next day was going to come around where I felt like that. And I was basically rejected from psychiatrists time after time because I was going in and telling the truth. And what I got from what my GP told me is you basically need to walk in with a noose around your neck to these cunts and say, if you don't take me, I'm going to kill myself. Yeah. And, and that's, sometimes that's, they still told me away. That's not right. You I know was let I mean? go of the clinic that I was in for three years when I was 18. I turned 18. I went to go for a counselling session mm -hmm. as normal because I, I, that was the pact I made with my mom. And I went and 
she we didn't even get to talk to her. She said to me, why well, you have to find somewhere else to go now because you're 18. And I was like, what? This is my comfort. You're the only person that I mm. talk to and now I have to go. And ever since then, I didn't go, never went back. Yeah, never no. looked for anywhere it's else. Just, it's just, it's just, it's just a lack of resources out there. And there's not enough funding from the government for, for mental health services that the ones that are out there. And it definitely is a big issue and it's one close to my heart as well because of, I've experienced it but I know, and I do still experience some things and everyone has off days but for with you in particular like you so, talked about self harm I said like when I you was coming for the eating and fucking binge eating and as yeah. a form of self harm I know people might not see it that way you know just see you're yeah. just sitting around like a fat fuck eating you know what I mean yeah. and I guess but maybe, is, yeah, maybe some days I am doing that as well but like uh, yeah, 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 it is a form of haunting yourself, you know, it's not healthy, you know, and it's, um, it's, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not a good place to be in, but for, in terms of actual, um, self-harm, I think it's, it's the percentages in women and young teenage girls in particular are higher than they are in men, but I think men are more likely to actually kill themselves yeah. and go ahead with suicide, but women suffer more with the self-harm aspect and side of things, and, uh, um, when was the first one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you mind talking about no, that? I remember. Yeah. Like I, I still remember. I it was the Christmas Eve, where two thousand fifteen, and I was in the shower, and I was just really, really down, and I just couldn't, I couldn't shift it. There was just nothing, like nothing about my life was good. I felt everything was just shit. Nothing was worth living. I was in that headspace for a month. And I remember taking a razor to my arm in the shower and it was a different type of pain. I felt a pain on the outside that was worse than a pain on the inside. And I needed to feel it. I just Did you feel like it was alleviating the pain from in her? Oh pain, yeah, I literally felt her. like I was there to just open in something and it was like a sense of relief. But at the back of my mind you know, I always knew it was, it was wrong. I always knew it was wrong in the back of my mind. But I just, I I had to do it. I was just like, this is just, it's taking the pain up here. It's too heavy. I can't do it anymore. I can't carry it. I need something else to do. And that, that's that's what I felt that time was my only resort. Mm. And, and then it was summer. So it, it was well, wearing long frequent, clothes. How frequent was it after that? I was, I was seeing the scars disappear and I felt like I was missing something. I felt like I was... Something about that was a part of you. Yeah. You attach yourself attach, to that. Yeah. And the thing is with that, like when we attach ourselves to things, I think if you attach yourself to something, any attachment that's unhealthy is it impedes you from becoming happy. It impedes on you, it stops you, it gets in your way of becoming enlightened almost, you know what I mean? And becoming the best version of yourself because yeah. you can't let go of it. It's like it's like drugs, it's like drink, it's like food, it's like so you sort of attachment to that was so unhealthy that it started to become familiar with you. Yeah. It became familiar and it's all you knew. It was comf comfortable for you to do. Not comfortable in the sense that like, it's kind of strange to say it's comfortable when it's actual, like it's causing discomfort, but yeah. for you it was... It was like a pain relief, but it was put me in pain. Mm. Yeah, that's strange, isn't it? Like, and so many young girls out there are doing it. Like, I mean, I remember, getting a call and told that, that you'd done it and I got to fucking fight my life when I heard about it I didn't know again you were going through that by yourself and you were so young and um, did it, when, did, when was that time when everyone kind of found out do you want to talk about that yeah I think it was the clinic as well I I hated going to it I used to have to miss Tuesdays and Thursdays in school two days a week in school to go to this clinic every day and I remember my mum went to work my brothers were ill me but I was in my nanny's and Ben was out anyways and I pretended to go that I was there. My mm. nanny rang me and I was like, Hey yeah, I'm out here mm. and then I was like I'm fucking going back to bed and then she found out that I wasn't there. Mm. And I was like, Do you know what? I'm sick of this, I'm sick of going to this place and that's it. It's, it's time it's time for me to finish, time for me to end. I remember going to the kitchen, getting a box of RSD tomorrow and a bottle of water and just going until I couldn't anymore. Grabbing, grabbing the razor, I sitting there, caught my wrist, and just I cried. I, I cried. I cried for God to take me. I just want, didn't want to be here, and I was like, "This is it. I'll be happy when I'm gone." And it was just. Did you say what did you took? I took paracetamol. Like, I have a box of paracetamol, and I sat on me 
sitting around the floor and I just cried for someone to take me. I talked to my auntie and I said, listen, I want, I want to see you, I miss you, take me with you. And I laid there for 20 minutes and then I got into the bed and I closed my eyes and I was thinking, right, this is it, this is, I'm gonna fall asleep and I'm not gonna wake up. Then I heard the door opening and I ran to the sitting room and it was my little brother. And he walked in and I dropped to the ground and he ran over to me and I'll never forget that look on his face. I'll never forget that panic. I was bleeding out, but I was foaming from the mouth and he was only a kid. And still to this day, I just wish I ain't never seen that. But he saved my life. If he didn't come in that day, I'd, I'd, they told me in the hospital that my organs would have failed if I would have fell asleep and I would have been dead. So that kid saved my life. And Do loved you think it. That, was that the last time you did it? No. No, again after that? Yeah. I remember... I so what was, like, I mean, if that wasn't enough for you, I know you, you saved your life that time, but if that wasn't enough for you to take... I was embarrassed. ...turn it around, what what did turn it around for you? Um, I, I remember then going to the clinic and them saying, there's a bed in the hospital for you, and I was like, mm. oh no, I am not going into the hospital. And I was like, yeah, you are, you're going in, you need help. And I was like, no, oh, fuck off, I don't need help. And then... I think I was like, I'm not going in here. And mm. I was like, I heard stories that people get worse and I, I can do it. And I remember saying to myself, I can do it. And I sat down with my ma and she cried and I was, I just was just like, but when I was in the hospital that day, I did regret it. Mm. And I was like, I need, I need, I need help. And I think only enough to that after so many years being like, don't need help, don't want help, nothing wrong with me. I was like, right, I need help went back to the clinic and I remember I tried it again and then I was like this isn't this isn't the way I need to live I, I can't live like this I have people that love me and I have people that need me here and I need to get better off but I need to get better for me yeah not for anybody else yeah, yeah. I think that's when it was I was like you need to do it for you now and I wasn't anybody I wasn't me brothers it was me mm. ma it wasn't anybody it was for you me you kind of came to that realization that yeah I think that's a, a big thing, isn't it? In today's world where someone's trying to turn their life around, they have to broadcast it. Yeah. And they're telling everyone, so like, you, you have to question, who are you doing this for? Yeah. You know, is it for you? Or is it for Facebook? Or is it for Instagram? You know, and when it's for someone else, it doesn't no matter how me. much the motivation is high at the start and you really mean that you're gonna do it, once that candle burns out, and the, uh, and the motivation is gone because it does go very quickly. You're not getting as many likes yeah. as the last post mm. and any comments, you know what I mean? You're like, yeah, oh. it's not as, again, this is why we're talking about, this is the name of this, is truth over popularity because everyone just wants to do what's popular. Yeah. And I think you see a lot of people out there nowadays who have been caught out online for, for lying about mental health, for, I've seen people lie about cancer, for like, dealerships, I think it was a girl in America who lied saying she had cancer and she got some sort of fucking dealership with some deal being endorsed by Apple and they found, they found out that she was lying about it so it's like all because it's popular they'll do anything, anything to be in the trend and I think that's what the, the issue is with social media but from from a young girl's point of view from being a teenager and growing up where what, what is your sort of viewpoint on social media, what way do you see it what way do you think, do you think it's does more good than harm? Do you think it's beneficial? Do you think it's... What do you think? I think social media is a very dark place. I think it's very, very open for people's opinions. So not many girls realise that you're gonna get hate for mm. the stuff that you put up and then they put this up and then they have to take it down. And it's just, a, it's just such a negative thing sometimes. And sometimes people are sharing the wrong thing like 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 i always see now with people sharing with weight loss and transitions and stuff like that they're constantly putting up in like hey how did anybody let me out like that they're mm. giving the wrong message do you know what i mean it, what do you mean <laughs> who let me out like that it's if you're choosing to go on this journey and you're posting go for it i'll clap for you myself but just i do think that you always have people looking at your stuff if you're putting this up to help somebody else Look at how you're holding it before you're sharing it. Mm. Because are you giving the right message? Are you giving mm. the wrong message? Or what are you giving? Mm. Like, are you, is there somebody at home that is 
big thinking oh, I shouldn't go out now mm. do you know what I mean yeah I think it's it is a nasty place when it comes to stuff like that but I do think if the right people are putting the right content out and the most positive content out it can be a very positive place mm. but I do think right now it's at its darkest especially with people sharing their views on the virus and stuff like that yeah well look, look, like I said I went off it because of that sort of reason it was for me I felt like it was just toxic I thought the information on it was toxic but then like what you say there is people do have an individual responsibility as to what they put out yeah but you can flip that as round as well and you can say well people also have an individual responsibility of what they want to view yeah so likewise you can always press on follow if you yeah. don't like what you see yeah. and i get that but i just think it, it, these people who are posting this out and like well if you don't like what you see on follow but are you being responsible there isn't young impressionable people probably watching your page that's what i'm saying as a young as a young yeah who aren't mature enough for to understand like well, I don't need this in my life this doesn't add value to my life and I think it's um, I have a block list at the end of Christmas now it's very me. yeah it's I, very it's very it's very complex though it's not just one of, it's not just black and white it's not simple you know when it's like we're unfollowing people like so I was going through the mill with it with social media it was just fucking annoying me it was actually it was just such a negative experience every time I went on to it yeah and this was towards middle of 2019 come towards the end of it and then i said i can't keep doing this i said so what i said i'll try to do because i needed it at the time for work and i said i can't get rid of it because i need it you know i depend on it for work and then i said what i'll do is i'll unfollow everyone right everyone just unfollow everyone and so we did that i unfollowed everyone because i didn't i wanted to be just using it to post out whatever content that I needed to post out and I didn't want to see anyone else's content yeah. and it wasn't that personal it was just for my own uh, peace of mind yeah. um, I didn't care what people were posting I didn't care you know, how many drinks you were having I didn't care what you were having for dinner I didn't care what your dog did I didn't <laughs> care what your kid did I don't care and I don't want to be seen and I don't care about your relationship you know and that's just the, tr the truth you know but what had happened was I find I find this very bizarre now. Now, most people probably think this way, but I find it very strange. My perspective on it is different. It's probably an unpopular opinion, but when I unfollowed so many pages, my followers dropped by 600 people. 600. Right, so I'm thinking, so there was six, probably more. There was 600 or more people that only followed me because I followed them. Yeah. Why? You know what I mean? So, I mean, if my page doesn't bring value to you, don't follow it. Don't don't consume my my information and my content if it makes you feel shit about yourself yeah. or if it makes you angry or if it if it has any emotional effect on you in any way possible that's not positive. Take it out of your life. You know what I mean? And I get that. But it's like, well, if you don't follow me, I'm not gonna follow you. Regardless of even if I, let's say my account was the fucking most information most inf best information you could get. Yeah. They don't care because he, well he unfollowed me yeah. and they take it personal yeah. they take it so personal <laughs> and i had one or two people message me about 10 minutes after i unfollowed them and they'd be like because there's an app did you just unfollow me and i'm like how the fuck did i even know there's an app i was told that yeah. tells people that you unfollow them so that yeah. rats you fucking out i know right so so it's not so people are afraid now to unfollow people because there's a fucking <laughs> app out there running on them no so it's like so I was like, the person was like, well, I think that's very strange. I was like, look, don't take a person. I think it's fucking strange that you know that I unfollowed you so yeah. soon. So it's like, in that sense, I feel like it's a very weird thing. But even then, I said, no, it's still fucking toxic. I need to get away from it. So I got away from it. I've been off it for a good year. I still don't use that account that has all those followers. I can't deactivate it. I'm very particular now in who I'm going to follow and how I'm going to use it and the time I'm going to spend on it now I'm more respectful of it um, but I feel like with social media is people think they're in control of it I don't think they are I think it's in the other way around you know and I think that's been proven with algorithms that constantly send you notifications that keep you coming back for more and the information that gets put on your screen that you're like who's only talking about bleeding pizza 10 minutes ago and this is telling me I want oh, this I is often the pizza if I want you think oh, the bastards are spying on me I know. you know what I mean so it's like it's all this sort of stuff but in terms of what you were talking about in 
in particular with body image and, and it's, it's just become a fucking epidemic it's an obsession now it's like it's everywhere and it's like people are constantly trying to change themselves like i said for social media and for validation and external validation and, and and approval from other people because they can't validate themselves yeah you know and it, it's not right i don't think to be living that way and i think in a world today now where you see more and more people going for fucking like cosmetic surgeries and and, and tr boob implants and hair transplants and arse implants and jaw do i think people are getting their jaws done their noses done and their fucking everything done i don't know what they're getting done but do you think social media has an impact on that do you 100%. think that is a direct correlation between that it's it's just like it's constantly in their faces and they're constantly being made feel like they're dissatisfied with something about themselves yeah because you're constantly watching all these people who are putting it out there like they're picture perfect and what happens is then you constantly consume that you start to compare yourself and the, the saying goes comparison is the thief of joy so yeah. if you're constantly comparing yourself you're robbing yourself of this that's joy that's the worst thing you can do I 100% just compare yourself and to people especially people that you don't even know we don't even know this person yeah, and it's just so, because they have 6 million followers doesn't mean you know them and it's so easy to fall into that trap and my, my view on it is with young women nowadays that are doing it it's, it seems to be more people are doing it than, more, than people that are not doing it yeah. you know whether it be fucking something so small as getting we don't know lips done you've got lips done yeah, have you yeah right twice. so we'll ask you in a minute why but before we get there i'm gonna say like what happens what my viewpoint is on it as a man is that i think it's the wrong thing to do because i think if you find something wrong about yourself now i'm gonna get slaughtered by feminists saying don't tell a woman what to do with her body no i'm not doing no, that because yeah. men are doing it as well i think men are worse yeah <laughs> and i think if you find something that's wrong with yourself and you really hate it that much and it's really bothering you that much i think the problem's in here i think the problem's in your head and i think that's what you need to go get fixed because if you get let's say it's your teeth and you go to talk and you get new teeth because every day it's on your mind every day it's crippling you and you go to talk you get your teeth on but you never got your head fixed you never you never delved into why is wow. this bothering me so much is a society making me this feel this way is it the circle i keep is it what is it anyway if you don't go and get that fixed and you go get your teeth fixed not long after that it's something else it's your nose you know what i mean yeah. or it's your fucking your jaw or whatever it is and you can and with social media you're constantly seeing stuff and people that are selling you stuff that are preying on your insecurities for profit they see they want they know what you're insecure about so they show their perfection or their image of perfection uh, to make you feel dissatisfied to prey on your insecurities and then they get money out of that because you're going to buy into it That's so the whole world out there. do you know what i'm saying yeah so i don't know what you think of that but what what's your no, opinion, 100%, you know? like and if someone asked me why i got my lips on all i can say is because i wanted them bigger do you know what i mean i never looked at myself and went think i'm very insecure about my lips very insecure mm. about my lips never only when people started getting their lips done i was like i want to try that Right. Really? You know so, I mean? but so you don't think like that, that it normalises. So you fell for a trend. Yeah. Right. Honestly, I did. I didn't. Why, think... But you say, why do you want them bigger? What 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 benefit does bigger lips bring to a person? I felt like that but, lip more confident. I say all the lads are screaming. The answers are this. I'm not gonna fucking. <laughs> I'd say, I think when I got them done, I felt a little bit more confident. I was like. I loved them. I was looking in the mirror and I was like, my lips are big. I like them. I can't wait to wear makeup on. Okay. It was just a little I'm back to my point. So I can go back to my point. So you had to change something about yourself to get gain confidence. Yeah. Which was cosmetically. Yeah. Which was about your aesthetic, about your appearance. You had to change that to gain confidence. Where you could, could you not gain confidence without that? I probably could have, yeah. Do you think that would have been a better or worse way? <laughs> to be quite honest, like... I think it's but very, it's very, women 50, are slashing 50, it's very 50 50 when it comes to that. Like, I, I think people do bash people for getting their lips done, and to be quite honest, I actually don't have an answer of why I got them done or why it was just. Well, then you need to go away, do some thinking. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, this is a session, though. 
This is a therapy session. It then. was just now, now thinking about like that wasn't like I wasn't like it was something that was on my bucket list for like my whole life. It was very impulsive. It was literally like exactly. I booked that up on a Tuesday and I got them done on a Saturday. And that's just the way it was. I just mm. wanted to try it out and yeah. I liked it. That's so why I got them done again. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Where is where is where do you draw the stop. line? You know what I mean? I think I'm stopping now. <laughs> yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Some people don't. You know, and it's yeah. just this is what I feel. I feel as they do with. They don't get what the real problem is fixed, but just the the root of the problem, which is in their heads, which is constantly making them feel unhappy and dissatisfied about themselves. And until you get that fixed, you're constantly gonna find something new yeah. that, that you don't love about yourself and that you hate you, you hate about yourself and that you're gonna want to get fixed and get replaced with something that's fake, rather than working on embracing who you really are <sighs> no i don't know i mean people could say well why do you want to why do people try to lose weight i mean because it's healthy it's you healthy. know it's yeah. it's 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 healthier to lose weight than to walk around obese and, and carrying that much excess fat around your organs and around your heart because it can cause heart disease it can cause diabetes it can cause cancers it can cause a list of fucking problems to land in the arm so there's more benefits to it than than you know so what yeah. you get like oh, i can understand that but I can't understand the shortcuts and the cosmetics and the, it's just something I never really understood. But again, I'm a bloke, but either way, I think social media is constantly, it, it, it's pushing that trap on young women and even young men nowadays. That if it's, it is where it is, I suppose. I suppose the world's gone that way and um, we can either, I don't know. I don't know if there's any much point fighting it, but I, hopefully it just changes. It's like the remember the mullet. Yeah. We had a mullet. When I, so I done it as well. When I, I fell for trans too. But then the mullet just died a hard death, thank fuck. <laughs> but like, I I'm, don't I'm know hoping that this well. I'm hoping that this dies a bit as well eventually and people can just start being fucking I don't know. Anyway, we'll move on. So uh with your depression, with your self harm, you obviously you haven't done that since and what's been a long time since years yes and yeah. that's a great thing yeah. so anyone who's looking in who might be relating to the stories that you're telling besides the fact that i got my lips done everything <laughs> else <laughs> i'm saying mm. i'm practicing the new self-love you know what i mean like, it's something that Look, i'm on a journey with like it is a journey it yeah. is a journey and it's, it's a learning curve and life is about but man and i mean fucking, no one knows everything you know and mm. some people like to think they do but like yeah but, it's uh, only when you look back you realise how much, how far you've came and how hard it actually mm. is, how so hard yeah, it actually is to deal with. Anyone out there who might be in that place now is what I wanted to say, who could be listening in, who, who is going through a dark place and I know it's very hard for you to use words to talk someone else but sometimes it, all it takes is one sentence or one fucking, one word or one one story or whatever to, to just click with someone and say, Jesus. This is giving me a whole new perspective. I can actually go and seek help now from a professional and it could be the turning point for them, you know. But would you have any advice for them? Would you have any, like young girls in particular? Who, One who thing that I'd say is do it for you. Mm. Do it for you because at the end of the day, when you're up at three o'clock in the morning battling your mind, who's there? You. you mm. You're there. I only had this conversation with my friend, the best friend, Vicky, the other day about you actually can't trust anybody but yourself. Mm. So, I mean, you can turn around and say, I trust you about this, or I trust you about that, but you don't know. Mm. So, I mean, you don't know who you can trust, only yourself. Mm. And if you can't trust yourself, well, then who can you trust? Do you know what I mean? So, I yeah. think that's something that you have to, you have and to trust. Trust with what? Like, like coming out and being, being vulnerable in these situations. I know, like, the likes of myself and yourself have, have opened up online, and that's a very, it's not a very, not, not something that everyone wants to do. It's not something that everyone will do. Some people, Will deal with things and overcome these things without ever publicly speaking about it. Yeah. But it leaves yourself vulnerable. So there's some people who are so afraid to talk about it because they don't know how to tell them. They don't know how they can trust that this person gonna go off and start bitching about it yeah. behind me back. If this person's sincere, do they really care about me? So is that what you mean by trust or what? I think when it comes to like what I'm saying, deal for you. Realise that you're worth doing it for. You might have amazing people around you, but why don't you do it for yourself? Why don't you do it for you that is going to look back, like I can look back on the last seven years, years and thank myself and be like, 
you done that. Mm. I done it. Nobody else done it for me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So I trusted myself yeah. for that. Yeah, I had one person like you are my person that I could relate to because I couldn't. I didn't want to tell anybody because I was like nobody understands and you're never gonna understand me and you don't understand what's going up in here. But having someone to go through similar things, not the same thing. Nobody goes through the same thing, but similar things also as well. Do you know what I mean? Like I always say, like if it is messaging somebody or if it is somebody that you don't know. Yeah. But just someone who makes you feel like you're not alone. Yeah, someone that listens to you and doesn't be like, oh yeah, I feel like that as well. Shut the fuck up. Yeah, I'm talking yeah, about yeah, me. Yeah, Do you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> sometimes that's all you need. Yeah, you need someone yeah. to listen to. And you. I actually, I was only speaking, funny you said, I was only speaking about that to someone recently. It's like, with some people, mental health only exists if, if it's about them. Yeah. You know, and it's oh, like, isn't yeah, sure. it's like, oh, I can't wait for you to finish talking. So, so I can tell you about myself. Me. Yeah, and it's like, yeah, I get you. I get and you. then sometimes you have them friends that don't understand, but that's also okay. Do you know what I mean? I have friends during the time that I was going through that, that didn't know how to deal with that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So you have that as well, the people that don't know, and it's not their fault. It's not their fault that they don't understand. So just, that's why you have to be... How do you exactly. how do you deal with life now on a daily basis? How do you stop from going back there? How what is it? What is your what is your way? Is it almost for me what now? The, since the pandemic hit last year, I finished college, so I was out routine. Yeah, I remember when and you I were in college. I've or, or seen a big change in you. Yeah, your whole, I was. Your whole actual change. Root, it's routine for for me personally. Mm. It's routine. Yeah, it's, I, I push routine. And I think like when I came over to stay with you a few weeks ago, when you were like, "Me, you don't have to have a job to be in a routine," and I was like. Mm. I actually don't because no. I didn't have a job do you know what I mean yeah. I, I wasn't walking so I was able to sleep in I was able to do what I yeah. wanted I was staying in bed I was staying in bleed do you know what I mean and I, I was just just doing whatever I wanted to but at the same time it was making me feel shit yeah I think what yeah what I said there is like what you said about, about the routine is a lot of people have been walking for so long that they've become dependent on a job yeah. to give them structure in their yeah. life and once that gets taken away, which it has for so many people, they lose it and they're bleeding, staying up to all hours and they're staying in bed to all hours and they're falling into these ruts. And it's so easy to fall into a rut and it's very hard to get out of. And it's it's no fault of their own because these lockdowns are just coming out of nowhere all the time. And who's to say when they're going to stop? And who's to say when they're going to get back to work? So these people don't know. And this is what my point is. It is a big change for them, but you don't, you shouldn't depend on a job or, or a boss to, and the fear of being late to work or the fear of missing a day to keep you structured and routine. You, yeah. should, you should apply that yourself in your own life. You should give yourself a, a structure and a routine. And I always say, even when you are walking, you should get up first thing in the morning and walk on yourself before you go to work for someone else. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So whether it's getting up and walking out, whether it's getting up and just fucking having the an hour to yourself in the morning without the phone and just fucking journaling or wherever. I think all of these little things help you stay on top of yourself. 100%. And, and they, they stop you from falling into these sort of dark places and, and depressive symptoms from coming back up out of the woodworks, you know? And yeah, with college for you, I feel like when you, when you start getting into that, you start doing something that you enjoyed and you were, you were living a life that you felt like you, you, you found something out that you enjoyed, you started you done a bit of training with me in the gym. You had a bit of a structure. You were, I think, you were off the drink for a while, yeah. right? And Just then eight months. Yeah, and then like, I mean, I felt like at that point, in any way, I felt like you were thriving in life. Yeah. I felt like you were loving life. It seemed like that from the outside, yeah, but again, nobody knows what goes on behind the door. But uh, yeah, so you were, what were you doing in college that you felt that was having that effect on you? I was studying drama, dance, music. It's something that I've done since I was a kid, academically in school. I was always behind, but when it came to dance, I felt like I was on top. Mm. I just felt like that was where I was comfortable. That's what I, I was good at. It. Do you know what I mean? And I wasn't afraid to say that I was good at what I'd done. And I just felt like I was getting to live my dream every single day when I was in college. Yeah, there was like shit going on at home. Do you know what I mean? But that was my escape. Yeah. That was where I could be a character and I was somebody else. And I also had to separate that. And I was like, this is something that I wanted to do for so long and I wasn't even going to finish. I was 17 at my suicide attempt, so I wasn't even going to finish school. Mm. So when I decided to go back to school, I didn't want to go to college. Yeah. I was sitting in school being like, me. whatever, I want to be finished. I'll do, I'll do what I want when mm. I finish. And it was only then that I was like, I want to just apply for that and see what happens. Yeah. I went for the audition and I got in and it was the best thing that I ever done. Yeah, and you loved it, didn't you? I and loved it. Is it, it I something really that did. you could oh, you want to apply to your future? Is it something you want to live with? Definitely. 
what do you do or where do you go about it's such a hard place to, to, to break into a hard industry and yeah it's hard to sometimes you need connections sometimes you need to really put yourself out there and, and, and interact and network with people that are involved in it and like I, I jesus it's something that yeah it's tough but where would you even start i think with me places? being only 21 i think i want to get the most training i can in yeah. like i want to get the the most information about what i want to do i what i do eventually want to teach i want to have my own dance skill that's what i want to do that's what i've always so that's said goal. that's me that's me long-term goal so my short-term goals are this year my goal is to get get strong as in like mentally, mentally and physically Resilient. i want to be a dancer so I want to teach, I want to be fit, I want to be, mm. I want my stamina to be the strongest I've ever been. So I mm. have a break, I feel like I'm on a, on a break this year. I'm out walking now, the last few weeks, mm. even buying mm. myself earphones in, walking. And little changes like that, it's making me excited. I'm like, yeah, I am, I can be strong, I can be fit. I've used to jog Bronson down, uh, yeah. down and back, it rained hell last snow I jogged. And I can be fit and that's what... I want to. I want to be. I want to be strong, and mm. that's what I want to, to do this year. And I do think that then next year, looking to my teacher's degree for training and drama, and then I can work in skills. Do you know what I mean? That's one way: earning income, saving money, all that stuff. And then eventually, America is me. The end goal. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Good. But look at you. At least you have something mapped out. And as long as you have a goal, you have something to walk towards. Yeah. And I like the saying goes is. Just because you have a goal, it doesn't mean you'll achieve it, but you'll go further than the person who doesn't. Yeah, and who it, doesn't I think have the little goals. goals are sometimes more important than... 100%. 100%. Goals. Um, you said there about when you went back to school, about your attitude in school, would be like, roll your eyelids up and say, I just can't be like, like, I'd say, I'd be sitting Where do you think that attitude me. comes from, Chloe? That sort of, I'm going to call it like, a, it's like a bratty attitude. Yeah. And is it, is it an inner city thing? Is it an immature thing? Is it both? What do you think? I've always been told by teachers that I had an attitude problem. I think that I, my whole life felt... Think you're a bomber or are you, you learned it? I off. think I felt very misunderstood. Really? I think I felt like I was... You are only treating me like that because I'm not being going through all this. You don't, like, I'm being treated differently. Mm. I always felt like I was treated differently in school, always. From a group of us that were from the inner city, I went to school in the ass Black Rock. Mm. Like all girls school, do you know what I mean? I always felt targeted as a group because I was from the inner city. Yeah. I spoke different. They made a known that we spoke mm. different. And then I think it just got to the point where I was like, well, I don't want to listen to these people anymore. They don't know me and they don't understand. Went rebellion I went rebellion I started it. to rebel then. Really? And that was immature. Yeah. That was an immaturity that I needed to... But today I graduated, I think I left that. Graduate yeah, skill, I left that behind because I looked at the teachers that helped me and they were only trying to help me. And yeah, you started respecting them. Yeah, yeah, I respected them. I did, I did have an actual problem. Yeah. And my mom probably tell you that I still do, but don't get me wrong, some teachers are still waggers. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, my little nephew like hates school, like, and he's the worst person you can ask for for advice. His mad as be saying to me, Isn't school the best age of life? Would you go back to school if you had a chance? And I was saying, No, no. I fucking hate it, but uh. I think I just felt, yeah, I felt misunderstood sometimes. And there was there was teachers out in that school that were absolutely great. And there was one in particular, and she was great, but sometimes I just felt. Yeah, you didn't want to be there. A charity case sometimes. Yeah, okay. So you said at the start, yeah, from Paris House, and you, you can't wait to get out of the place or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Where's that? <laughs> it's a gift. I swear to God, there's no filter when it comes to them flats. It's just a negative environment for me mm. I people probably love it i don't know for me it's just negative i feel like it's full of a lot of small-minded people people that ha not even small-minded people people that are, have their life set there people that have their kids there that are going to live there for the rest of their mm. life and i look at that as in oh my god i couldn't imagine yeah raising kids in these flats i couldn't imagine coming home from work to these flats i couldn't personally imagine my life i don't think i'd ever be able it's to it's not for you no i'd never be able to fulfill my full potential living in them flats that's yeah. spot on the street fair enough and, and there is some people who just like a simple life who like yeah who like to go to work and come home and close but there's also people that think that they can't get out of there even though they can't that's what i'm they've convinced coming, themselves yeah that's what i'm thinking small minded like they think i can't get out here but do you think that's small yeah. minded by choice or do you think they've been conditioned to think that way my thing is, is, I look at the youth in the area and I think it's too easy to just fucking brand them all with the one bush and say, it's little scumbags or little pricks and little this. 
they don't know anything else. They've been taught that all their lives. They look, like you said there, like you felt like a bit of a charity case in school. It's like that these young lads aren't getting fucking told they can be on, and they've no self belief. Mm. You know what I mean? And they're growing up around looking at all the fucking luxurious stuff that the the, the other people have, and and they're falling into things that they won't have forever. But they don't realize they're that they're falling into drugs and fucking everything else, and it's. You have a younger brother who's 16, you probably worry about him. I know yeah. we, we worry about my nephews as well, but there's only so much you can do. Yeah. At the end of the day, they're their own little people and they don't want to be hearing their uncle coming over crazy to them. Because I know if I was 16 and my uncle came over to me, I would have told the fuck off, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I went through it myself, I openly spoke about it. Um, it's just something that you, you kind of have to go through and hope that people mature. If You don't have to go through it, but if you go through it, you're going to have to hope that you come out of it. And not everyone from the flats goes through it, um, but do you think it's worse today? I, I feel like it's worse today 100%. than when I was growing up. I think it's fucking everywhere. There was clubs. I was in. I was in clubs every day of the week. There was a place for us to go. There was always something to. to there was different. There was everything for us to do, and now the kids are just standing in the flats. There's a pitch that doesn't mm. be open. There's just all of this stuff. Just. No resources there for them. Yeah, well, I, I, well, I, th I actually met with St Andrews last year because I felt like there was no resources, but they actually told me there is a lot of resources. It's just a lot of the young fellas just don't want to do them, you know yeah, what I mean? That's what like, I mean they're, they're, getting, they're getting told, like, I mean, they're getting told that, like, it's not, one, maybe it doesn't interest them. Two, they're getting a bit of a stick off their mates, and that, that's the turn of them going into things, you know, and that stops them from going down that way. and that's what leads them down another road because what else are you going to do? They're bored out of fucking head. Some of them end up on drugs. Some of them end up selling drugs. Some of them do both. Yeah. And they're, they're sitting around with nothing to fucking do and I feel like it's too easy to point the finger at them as the problem. I mean, what about the people who just, who are funding this thing? You know what I mean? What about the, 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 the office workers who are in town and every night out and they're ringing up and they're, they're giving the 100 euro for a little bag of coke. You know what I mean? They're funding that. Without them people, there is no drug dealers. Yeah. Do you get me? And they're getting off scot free. If they think they're not compliant in and uh, uh, playing any part in what's actually happening with these young kids, well then they're, they're fucking dead wrong they're, and they're ignorant. And so for some of the kids, it's close to home. It's something that they just they they, they don't know. They don't know what else. And my big problem with, with drug dealing, especially in these sort of areas, is there's just not enough teachings about it in school. And what I always look at it is. is it's 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 a materialistic lifestyle. It's very empty. It's very unfulfilling. It's um it's not a life. It's a dark life, on the inside. But on the outside, looking in, it looks like it's materialistic. It looks great. But you can't see paranoia. You can't see worrying about who the who who's coming from me. Is it the police? Is it the other fella that I owe money to? Is it this? Is it that? Yeah. And it's no way to be living. You know what I mean? And I just see. It getting worse as it's going on. What do you think of that? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think from when I was a kid to now, uh, there's it's completely different. Like you, you, you don't even see the kids playing the flats anymore. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You don't you don't see that many kids playing the flats and police are in them twenty four seven and in and out. The kids shouldn't have to see that. And then they're like, what's what way is that condition in the kids' mind? They're constantly seeing police doing this and raiding people and. And, and searching people, you know. It's no, a, and that's the thing. Like, and then the they think that's normal. The kids and the no stage, kids should grow up to think that that's normal. No, they're constantly being searched and they're constantly at them, and they just, they don't get a minute then, and then they it's back and forth with the police, and it's just not a nice thing to have mm. to say all the time, and it's not a nice thing for like I have to see my brother standing on the stage getting searched. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It's not it's not a nice thing that I want to say. I want to get away from. Him. I want to get out of it. I'd just take him with me if he was to come with me. I'd take him. But I do think it's at its worst now, and I couldn't imagine getting any better now, to be honest. Yeah, maybe not. But let's look. I think, I always say, every, everyone can change, you know what I mean? And I hope people can, but it's up to the individual to want yeah. to change, you know? And, and some people get self sucked in, and some people, they don't have a great start in life, they don't have. But a lot of people use that as an excuse, too. Sometimes it's the only option, but then. Sometimes, you know, there's a lot of fucking. Anyway, probably another conversation for another day because we're running out of time, but. Um. Yeah. Look, as I said, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having uh, me. there's anything else you want to get in the last minute or so there? If you want to say to Anne, to anyone who might be listening in, who might be going through a tough time at the minute, other than what you said earlier about do it for yourself. If there's any piece of advice you'd like to give, have a go with the camera there and give it a go. Um. I think if you're a young girl, young boy, it doesn't matter what age. If you're older, younger, if you've ten kids, if you've two kids, and one kids, 
your story matters and somebody out there will relate to you. No matter what age, I've had grown men text me telling me thank, thank you for sharing a story that my story, my personal life. So somebody's out there to listen and it's as cliche as it is, you actually are never alone. And there's so many people on social media. I'm praying and hoping that it has a positive spin in the next few years because it can be a very positive place. Right, brilliant. Thanks very much for coming on. Thanks.